that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. As a policymaker, you know, our number one priority um, has to be to restore uh, price stability. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Perilous predictions, the S&P drops nearly 18% on the year. The famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's been warning about is still yet to pop. Keeping up the pressure yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point from the ECB. The Fed's Loretta Messer says rates need to rise above 4% by early next year. Plus, Chandu lockdowns. China puts 21 million under new COVID measures, the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Well, it's a gloomy day, and we are getting Euro area manufacturing data coming in basically in line, if not slightly, slightly weaker. 49.6 is where it's coming in. The preliminary figure was 49.7. So not too much change there, but it is a gloomy day. Overall dominated by some of the negative stories coming out of China, be it a new lockdown, be it also concerns on chip makers. NVIDIA warning on their profit, given some of the U.S. regulations on selling artificial intelligence to China. So that means overall we have a down day so far, about an hour into cash trading, down more than 1% for the Euro stock 600. Yields basically unchanged with a two-year yield still at a punchy level right below three and a half percent. So we are looking at, you know, not even a rise of one basis point. But even so, that lift higher in the front end of the curve has been enough to lift the dollar and make that rate differential, say, with Japan become even more painful. That's why we're seeing the yen continue to fall. We're getting ever closer to that 140 level versus the dollar. It says it's up now because, of course, dollar at the front of this pair. 139.3 is where we stand. That's a rise of about a quarter of one percent. You also have the Bloomberg dollar again. It's a Overall, a strong dollar story continues to be the only haven we can look for. So turning to Europe, you won't find many havens in this equity market. It is a painful day. Red basically anywhere. Honestly, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find anywhere in Europe that isn't deeply in the red or selling off more than 1%. UK down 1%. Cacaron down more than 1%. The DAX and the FTSE MIB. All of them under pressure today. So it looks at least so far like we're headed for another day of losses. So that's the public story. But what about the private story coming up later in the show? We're going to be speaking to Brookfield, which is seeking to ramp up its exposure in Europe. We're going to talk equities. We're going to talk tech investing in private equity and much more with managing director Anuj Ranjan. That will be about 930 a.m. London time. Now, traders, they are confronting the prospect of even bigger rate increases from the ECB. Hikes of 125 basis points by October are being priced in with at least 175 basis point hike now fully baked in. At the same time, the Fed's Loretta Messer and Lori Logan have reiterated their determination to get inflation under control. My current view is that it will be necessary, necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. Hearing um, from central bankers and academics um, around the world, um, the clear priority was uh, bringing inflation down. And that really lines up with my own priority, um, being uh, president of the Dallas Fed and, and as a policymaker, you know, our number one priority um, has to be to restore uh, price stability. Well, we've got the all-star team out for you to discuss. We have John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, and Christine Aquino from our markets team. Um, Christine, fresh off your New York trip, so it only feels right to talk to you about U.S. assets. Look, we, we continue to see this pressure in yields having this big impact, be it the yen, be it equities. We're starting off fresh with the month of September. I mean, at what point do we call time? At what point do we say we're willing to buy the dip? Well, Danny, that was the narrative over the summer, right? But clearly it has proven very temporary because, again, we're revisiting kind of the fears that we had at the start of the summer, which is essentially that the Fed and other major central banks are really going to be embarking on this massive tightening cycle and will be prioritizing inflation despite all the growth warnings, the recession warnings that we've been given. And, you know, over the summer, that narrative kind of faded, particularly in when I was in New York, you know, there was definitely this narrative of peak inflation, maybe 
things aren't so bad. But again, we get a fresh reminder from the Fed speakers that we've seen this week, from the ECB pricing that we've seen this week. 75 basis points is probably the new game in town that we're looking for now. I gotta say, John, it, it feels like a lot of people have that same feeling that Christine's laying out at the moment. This idea that markets still need to reprice. Jeremy Grantham says that, you know, the super bubble hasn't popped yet. Mike Wilson, yes, he's a perma bear, but keeps saying that we need to go lower. Do we need to retest those June lows? Does that make sense to you? I think it does, because I think a couple of things have happened. First and foremost, the earnings revision cycle has only really just gotten underway. Historically, you have to be half to two-thirds of the way through that downgrade cycle before stocks find a base. And then this whole sort of summer exuberance, it felt a little bit like the Mamma Mia sort of <laughs> dancing scene with markets just thinking, this is getting that. better. <laughs> and then it's suddenly come down to earth with a bump following uh, the Jackson Hole speech. And we've remembered that the Fed have a job to keep inflation under control. And with employment looking good in the States, they can be laser focused on inflation. And of course, what that means, all of a sudden, the valuation support, even in the face of weaker earnings, suddenly isn't there anymore. So yes, I'm sorry to say, I do think that we've got a little bit more of a torrid autumn ahead of us with regard to stocks. And now I have ABBA stuck in my head, so thank you for that, John. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, Christina, I, I think it is interesting, kind of what John's talking about, this idea that it's the Fed coupled with earnings. It's the margin compression at the same time that easy money is gone. Where, where do we stand on analyst revisions for earnings, what expectations are. I mean, do, do they have the bad news priced in? I, I would tend to agree with John. I think sentiment really, when it comes to earnings expectations, still has to uh, quite a way to to go down, and that's probably the most difficult aspect of equity sentiment overall. That's that's uh, it's, it's the hardest to change, right? Because you will have the eternal optimist, particularly in the equity markets. Again, trying to push that narrative and believing that maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's a way that the Fed can achieve the soft landing without us plunging into a recession, or even if we do get a recession, it'll be short and shallow. We've definitely heard that phrase a lot of times from uh, the optimists in the market. But again, the reality is that those expectations when it comes to earnings growth moving forward really haven't budged all that much mm -hmm. despite the bad news that we've seen throughout the, the, the year so far. And so I think that's where that, that pressure will come from this autumn. And, you know, once we get that, that sentiment clean out by the end of the year, perhaps that's when we can start seeing a little bit more green shoots heading into 2023. Yeah, the sentiment clean up, I feel like we've had so many head fakes with that one I mean especially I, I got to turn to Europe because if we're talking gloom and doom it feels John that like Europe is is the center of it right now European stocks they've obviously have been under a lot of pressure are you tempted at all by valuations or is this just a region you don't want to touch oh my goodness um, yes of course I'm tempted by valuations and look Europe it, this is not the same Europe that we were dealing with back in the 2010s this is a Europe with a solid banking sector decent uh, you know, you know, regulatory reforms that have gone through, you know, decent household balance sheets and good corporations, and it's a very much more balanced market than it was sectorally. The thing is, it's cheap. Earnings actually have got some operating leverage to them if and when Europe does get through the uh, you know, probable recession that's ahead of it. But most importantly, there's just too much hair on this at the moment. There's mm. just a little bit too much in way of event risk, whether it's from energy, whether it's from policy, etc. And I think until that clears, it's cheap for a reason. But I would push back on those who think that Europe is that kind of structural underweight. Mm. I do believe Europe will be one of the winners when we get to the next cycle. But we've just got to have some patience here and now. Yeah, still a lot of unknowns. And uh, I'm seeing now uh, von der Leyen saying that they're going to outline their power plan in se on a September 14th speech. So even that, we, we mm -hmm. still have to wait a little bit more. And Christine, this seems to be one of the, you know, the prevailing factors in terms of the concern about Europe is what's going to be the energy story. Until then, what happens to these energy intensive industries, ones that are looking at demand rationing going forward? Well, Danny, I think we can expect a pressure moving forward, particularly as we head into the winter time. I mean, really, this growing energy crisis has been a bit of a specter over most European assets, whether it's in equities or the euro. And there is very good reason to as to why the euro at the moment is still hovering around that parity level, despite the fact that we've had this massive repricing in ECB rate 
rate hike expectations because mm -hmm. that in itself would you would think that would be negative or positive for the right. currency but because there's this big counterweight of the energy crisis a lot of uncertainty is still there we don't really know you know what's the plan <laughs> heading into the winter still and that's definitely weighing on sentiment on European assets in yeah, general. That mechanism of higher yields lifting the currency is just not happening in this environment. Christine thank you so much for joining as always that's Christine Aquino and John you're not getting a break stick around we're keeping you John Bilton head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. Now coming up China puts 20 million 21 million people under new COVID measures in the mega city of Chengdu. We're going to get the latest next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. China will impose its biggest COVID lockdown since Shanghai, starting from 6 p.m. local time today, with the measures in place indefinitely. Chengdu's 21 million residents will need a negative test to leave the city, and families will be allowed to send only one person out once per day for groceries. Joining us now is Bloomberg's China health reporter, Linda Liu. Um, you know, Linda, it's, it's already a very challenging summer being faced by residents and businesses in Chengdu, which of course is the capital of the uh, Sichuan province province. How does this add to those headaches? Yes, uh, Chengdu residents have been uh, facing a very tough time recently um, because uh, China is experiencing its worst drought in history. So Chengdu has, as well as other parts of the Sichuan province, have been experiencing rolling power cuts. Uh, people haven't had air conditioning to cool them down. So it's making conditions quite tough, as well as um, for businesses, the rolling power cuts have been impacting production there. So now that you have a COVID lockdown on top of that, um, the energy supply use with everybody at home is going to go up. So that's going to be a question for how people are going to manage with that. And uh, Chengdu um, will also be undergoing a mass testing campaign in the next three days. With the heat that is going on outside, uh, people will have to queue for hours um, in the sun. So um, it's going to be quite, um, quite a tough challenge for the residents there. And, and of course, we have the uh, Party Congress coming in October. How does continued COVID flare-ups change the political calculus? So uh, the Communist Party um, has uh, always maintained that the COVID zero policy, which is, um, you know, employing, uh, employing snap lockdowns, uh, quarantining confirmed cases, as well as close contacts to cut off transmissions. Uh, these have had success in stamping out infections, but they are getting more and more costly as you have uh, more contagious uh, variants of the coronavirus um, breaching defenses in China. So we've seen um, Shanghai went through a really grueling two months lockdown uh, in spring. So there was a lot of suffering there. So there's a big uh, swell of criticism against COVID zero. And um, the hope is from a lot of businesses as well as the public that the upcoming party Congress could be a meeting in which China's leadership could take some of these feedback into account and change the direction of how the country is going to manage COVID going forward. But um, that's all speculation. As President Xi Jinping has firmly committed to the COVID zero policy mm. for political as well as um, uh, health reasons. Okay, Linda, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Linda Liu in Hong Kong, keeping us up to date. John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management, is still with us. And, and John, you know, when we're talking about attractive valuations, things that, that have sold off a lot, it's hard not to put China mm. in that conversation. Now, previously it had been, okay, perhaps there'll be some lifting of COVID measures, and that's this big catalyst to buy. I mean, it seems like we're really far from that. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look back at the beginning of the summer, China had a pretty aggressive snap upwards mm. um, because, and a lot of that was technically led, as you rightly say, 
earnings expectations on their knees, valuations inexpensive and positioning washed out. So a little bit of good news went an awfully long way. What we didn't get was follow through. Because remember, China is you know, the counter to the US and, the Euro and Europe where it doesn't have the inflation issues that we're facing in these regions. It has capacity to stimulate. Yet the stimulus that we got, the commitment to growth targets, which had been laid out at the beginning of the year, was notable by its absence. And when that comes through, you've kind of got to assume, well, look, China's inexpensive at the moment. Earnings expectations are pretty low, but it may well be a 2023 story mm. before you can start to see some healing around the COVID policies and some more stimulus coming through. So again, as your reporter rightly pointed out, the Party Congress is incredibly important. So it's one of those ones you don't want to get caught short in for certain. But I still feel that we've got a little bit of uncertainty to work through, mm. particularly with regard to stimulus. And, and, and John, also shame on me because I do feel like I've been framing the conversation a bit in, in terms of equity. But, but you prefer credit to equity. Walk me through why. Yeah, well, we do. Um, broadly speaking, look, risk assets in general, when you get weakening growth, are going to go down together. But there's a lot more support for the balance sheet today than there is for the income statement. We're seeing earnings getting cut, we're seeing margins under pressure, costs going up for corporations, households, the like. But bear in mind, through COVID, there was a lot of terming out of borrowing. Balance sheets are in good shape. We've already had a lot of default cycles in energy, and energy's not the problem this mm. time around. And actually, if we look at where we stand today, the normal pattern that would apply to credit over a recession may well not hold this time. So sure, credit spreads could widen if we get weakness in the stock market, but we would argue that it's likely to be more contained, and actually that's where the bargains may be able to be found. As we start to get some confidence coming back in, as we get a more sensible pricing of the mm. outlook, that could be the first place to be starting to look right. to get back into risk. I do think that energy portion of it is really fascinating and just, just how different this cycle is. 100%. Does that also mean we just kind of skip the default part of this cycle then? Well, look, I mean, you know, as credit, as, excuse me, as capital gets harder to come by, you know, there's always going to be those who are starved of capital and, you know, end up in a default situation. But bear in mind, we went through a period of weakness through COVID, which cleaned out some of the weaker um, firms. And the big clean out that happened back in 2015, it, the weakness in the commodity markets then, also meant that you've got much safer balance sheets. You've got higher credit quality across the high yield segment. US high yield is more than 50% double Bs today. So the reality is we're looking at a very different index. So historical comparisons, while always incredibly important, need to be adjusted for that sector and that ratings mix. And, and, and I just got to squeeze this in. We don't have too much time here, John. But if you are favoring investment grade over high yield, does there first need to be more pricing in of rate risk as we look, you know, Mester yesterday, for example, saying we got to go to 4%, maybe beyond, we're not going to cut our target. Mm. I mean, I think we've probably, we've seen the price action in the, um, in the belly of the US curve. And once you get up towards that three quarter, three and a half kind of level, it seems to run out of steam. Because at that particular point, the attractiveness of actually starting to hedge out liability streams brings a whole block of buyers back in to both higher grade credit and also to duration. So remember, it's not just about the rate outlook, it's about what people do with those instruments. Mm. And not everybody is looking for a price return. Some are looking for cash flow management. And at 3.5%, it's very, very attractive relative to where it's been over the last 10 years. All right, John, afraid we're just out of time. Really great to get your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. John Bilton there, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. Now, coming up later in the show, Brookfield seeks to ramp up its exposure in Europe. We're going to talk private equity and much more with managing director Anuj Ranjan. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, a uh, Bloomberg scoop with Russia mulling buying as much as $70 billion of friendly currencies. That includes the yuan. Now, eventually, they would shift to a longer-term strategy, according to people familiar, to sell its holdings of the Chinese currency. That would be to fund investment. Now, this plan, again, seen by Bloomberg, won initial support at a meeting. Um, and let me just read to you a quick line from this presentation they have on it, that the frozen $300 billion were of no help to Russia. On the contrary, they became a vulnerability and a symbol 
of missed opportunities. Let's get to our other top news now with the Bloomberg First Word is Leanne Garens. Leanne. Good morning, Danny. Liz Truss, the bookmaker's favorite to succeed Boris Johnson, has ruled out introducing any new taxes if she becomes the UK's next prime minister. At the final Conservative Party leadership hustings, Truss also said she would not introduce any new windfall taxes on the energy sector. The results of that election will be announced on Monday. Now a top UN official says China has committed serious human rights abuses against ethnic Muslims in the Xinjiang region and may be guilty of crimes against humanity. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, cites testimonies alleging patterns of torture as well as the demolition of holy sites. Beijing tried to block her report and says its actions in the region are aimed at clamping down on both extremism and terrorism. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, we're going to be speaking to Brookfield as they ramp up their exposure to Europe. We talk private equity next. This is Bloomberg. Perilous predictions, the S&P drops nearly 18% on the year. The famed investor Jeremy Grantham says the super bubble he's warning about has yet to pop. Keeping up the pressure, yields rise as investors fully price in a 75 basis point hike from the ECB. The Fed's Loretta Mester says rates need to rise above 4% by early next year. Plus, Chengdu lockdowns. China puts 21 million people under new COVID measures the biggest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now let's turn to the world of private capital and Brookfield is seeking to ramp up its exposure in Europe. The Canadian investment firm plans to open an office in Germany as it looks to tap deal opportunities in Europe's powerhouse. Well, I'm pleased to say we're now joined by Anuj Ranjan, managing partner at Brookfield. Anuj, thanks so much for joining us. And I feel like you sort of encapsulate this push for Europe since you are based uh, here in London. I wonder, as you look to move more into Europe, open offices, make more investments, how does the prospect of a downturn in the nations, in the continent, color those decisions? Look, thank you for having me, Danny. And there could not be a better time to be a value investor. Um, the There are many headwinds, as you just described. Uh, the market can, in many ways, not look pretty. But in fact, for a group like us, who's a long-term investor, prioritizes investing in cash flow generative assets and businesses, this environment actually limits competition and creates a ton of opportunity. I mean, we're now sitting on over $110 billion of cash and available capital. It's the most we've ever had in our history. And I think now is a very opportune time to have that kind of dry powder available for, for a market like Europe, where mm. some of these things are, are uh, more challenging. Are, are people willing to sell right now? Because I, I ask that because I especially think of, of, of other private equity funds who maybe are looking at the prospect of selling at, at a pretty depressed multiple compared to what they bought at. I, who is selling and, and are they? Is, are, is, are the deals plentiful, even if you want them? Well, Europe does slow down in August, so it's been not as active as it used to be. But, you know, we very, in the last 18 months, have put $30 billion to work. Uh, we did an acquisition very recently in uh, Deutsche Telekom's tower units in Germany. And uh, prior to that, we bought a company called Modulaire, pan-European leader in leasing ser modular leasing services for $5 billion. So we're putting capital to work. We're finding opportunities. Yes, there are those who aren't feeling any pressure to sell, probably aren't. If you mm -hmm. can hold on to an asset, if you have a long-term view, you probably would hold. But uh, Is that what we're seeing, private equity holding for longer? I would say in most cases, private equity sponsors that aren't, uh, do not have uh, an issue in the debt markets would hold for longer. Well, what are the ramifications of that? of companies being private for longer? You know, if you've bought a business, as we often do, prioritizing the cash flows, and you underwrote situations like this, and you took a long-term view, you're fine holding businesses for longer because they're generating cash. In, in situations where a business is not generating as much cash, and you're not able to pull out that dividend or that yield, you might be in a more of a challenging situation. Mm. And in, in terms of sort of your sector mix, when folks think about Brookfield, they probably think about, you know, industrials. They, of course, think about the infrastructure segment of Brookfield as well. 
do you need to shift away from that if you are looking at especially, you know, capital intensive energy uh, industries, industries that need to use a lot of energy when it's really expensive right now, that prospect being a difficult one in this environment? So we have been investing in new sectors. Uh, Technology is one where we've made a, a large uh, investment, many large investments, been growing fairly significantly. But uh, the type of technology we invest in is what I like to call industrial technology. This is cash flow generative, generative, mature, profitable businesses that provide essential products and services that are hard to be replaced or replicated. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what new shiny toy comes out, no one's replacing their Bloomberg terminals. <laughs> in the same way, we like to invest in businesses that are very sticky, even if they are tech. So they mm. have the same characteristics as an industrial or an infrastructure company. And uh, we recently acquired a company called CDK in the US, $8.3 billion. This company has 70% market share of large US auto dealerships. Mm. And so it's not going away, nothing's changing. Do they um, trade like tech or industrials though? And that's the great thing, is that the NASDAQ being down of 25% this year, yeah. um, it has brought some of the great tech names down with it. And that was a public to private where we thought it was a pretty uh, great opportunity, I think in uh, time, we'll look back and see it was maybe one of our best investments. Well, this, this goes back to this idea of, you know, are private investors selling? Is it, are we going to look back on 2022 as, you know, the year of take privates where that's where the most ample opportunity is? I think we could. Um, in 2008 and 2009, many firms like ourselves and, and many others actually made some of their best investments. Uh, these cycles, again, if you take a long-term view, as long as you underwrite and you plan for the uh, bumps in the road that we have ahead, uh, this would be a great time. The public markets are not valuing businesses the way the private markets are. Sometimes they're valuing them better, and at that time you see a lot of IPOs. Today, I think private sponsors should be doing more public mm. to privates. So when you are having the conversations with your portfolio companies, again, I, I go back especially to this idea, maybe not the tech ones, but ones that are having to deal with high inflation, with energy costs. When you're looking at a scenario of, let's say, demand rationing in areas like Germany, which you're pushing more into, Absolutely. What do those conversations look like? What, do, what does the playbook look like for the emergency scenario? So in this case, you know, we've, uh, we've always followed a mantra of investing in businesses where we underwrote a downturn from the beginning. Mm -hmm. For 12 years, maybe that hasn't always happened, but what it did mean was we bought businesses that were resilient, high quality, and generated cash. And uh, as uh, Howard Marks once said, uh, always uh, never forget the six foot man who died crossing the stream that was on average five feet deep. <laughs> We like to plan ahead for these environments, and so our businesses that we own today, our portfolio is quite resilient. That same approach, if we apply it as a long-term investor, if we just look at the long-term cash flows, these, this next six to 12 months, as difficult as it might be, will not make a huge impact on the total value of the I business see. over time. D does that mean you need to pull those levers, like cutting costs, rising prices, price, passing prices along? Is that happening more now? Uh, great businesses that are mission critical and provide an essential product or service can pass on those price increases. We are seeing that happen in many cases. Um, in many cases, we actually are implementing, we always implement an operational improvement plan. It's where we think we get the majority of our returns. Mm. It's always been our thesis, our fundamental underwriting thesis, even in technology. And uh, it's where we continue to see opportunity today. So I, I got to press you just finally on, on one thing your CEO said in, in the earnings call last. You talked about, you know, private equity being among the most difficult to fundraise with in private capital right now. When you're having conversations with LPs, with investors, kind of what are what are their biggest fears right now? What, what do you need to calm them of and assuage them of in this current environment? Look, they, they want to see cash flow. And I think um, buying businesses that generate a lot of cash that are highly cash generative and withstand the test of time is very important. Thankfully, that's an area we spend a lot of time in. And I think they are they're consolidating amongst uh, a few managers who have the capability, have a global setup, have a deep operational capability to deliver these returns. Mm. All right, Anuj, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much Thank you very for much. joining us. Great to have you on the program. Great to Anuj Ranjan there, Managing Director at Brookfield. Let's get now to your Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Hi, Danny. NVIDIA shares fell in late trading after it warned that new rules governing the export of artificial intelligence chips to China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. The stock dropped on the disclosure that the chipmakers A100 and forthcoming H100 products will require approval from the U.S. government before they can be sold to Chinese customers. Now, Australia's home prices saw their largest monthly drop.
drop in almost four decades in August. CoreLogic reports that prices in Sydney, the country's largest market, slid 2.3%, with Melbourne dropping 1.2%. The national index registered its biggest decline since 1983, with rising interest rates expected to drive further falls both this year and next. The Italian government's plans to sell the airline that emerged from the ashes of the troubled former flag carrier Alitalia may be dead on arrival. That's after Georgia Maloney the leader of the right-wing bloc that's expected to win the upcoming election, said she's opposed to selling state-owned ETA Airways to an investor group including Air France, KLM and Delta. Now, 3M plans to eliminate jobs as part of a broader cost-cutting drive in response to the slowing US economy. The scope of the cuts flagged in an internal memo is not yet clear. 3M has underperformed in recent years amid supply chain snags, currency fluctuations and also rising costs. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. Well, let's get more on the central bank story and focus in on Europe, where ECB officials are under pressure to act more aggressively to fight inflation. Hikes of 125 basis points by October being priced in, with at least one 75 bit hike now fully priced. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. I mean, Lizzie, these markets adjusting quickly, what's led to it? Well, economists as well have changed their calls from 50 basis points to 75 basis points, and they did it in quick succession after that euro area inflation print yesterday, hitting an all-time, new all-time high at 9.1% in August. And of course, it's not just, uh, it, it's broad-based, put it that way, which means that this inflation is likely to last. It came despite the fall in oil prices. But it's not just because of the raw data, it's also because of all this hawkish commentary that we've had out of the ECB uh, at Jackson Hole and since. I think it's six governing council members now who've said that they want at, at least a discussion of more than a half point hike. And you've heard the, the Fed as well being so hawkish. It's already done two 75 basis point hikes, which is difficult for the uh, governing council to ignore and not feel behind the curve. But in these economists' notes, they emphasize that it's a close call because, of course, we had Philip Lane, the chief economist, very influential, calling for a cautious approach. And that's largely because of the risk to Italy, given its uh, exposure to borrowing, higher borrowing costs. Right. And Lizzie, I know you've had to do some fast reading because just minutes ago we had the BOE publishing that decision makers survey poll. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through it. Was anything particularly interesting in there that especially might influence their uh, decision making? Yeah, so looking ahead, the CFOs of businesses of all different sizes uh, are seeing inflation CPI to be 8.4% one year ahead, up from 7.3% in the July survey, and 4.2% in three years' time. So this is higher than the last reading, which already uh, was considered to be above the level that's comfortable for the Bank of England to be reaching its inflation target. This print is important to the Monetary Policy Committee ahead of its September meeting because it shows how much inflation will be be embedded, it's become an increasingly important indicator to the MPC. So it really does add to the case for a half point hike from the BOE in September. And, and talk to me about where we stand when it comes to the politics front on the UK. The next, uh, the front runner for the race, of course, ruling out uh, tax increases last night. Yeah, we heard from both the candidates at the London hustings yesterday, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. Liz Truss not only saying that she wants tax cuts, but also ruling out tax rises. And that's despite, if you remember, this Bloomberg scoop, which said said that if the windfall tax were continued, it would generate tens of billions of pounds of revenue to help with the cost of living crisis because of the excess profits of energy companies. Instead, Truss is saying that she wants tax cuts and a new one on the table. Bloomberg Scoop yesterday uh, saying that uh, she would actually cut business rates, which have been so unpopular with businesses, it would kill two birds with one stone by allowing businesses more room to pay their energy bills this winter. Okay, Lizzie, thank you so much for the update. That's our very own Lizzie Burden. Now coming up, Perno Ricard CEO, Alexandre Ricard, on the results at the French Drinks Maker. We'll have that interview for you next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, French distiller Pernod Ricard has reported full year revenue that was at a record as consumers drank more scotch coming out of the pandemic. The makers of alcohols, including Absolute Vodka, also signaled further price hikes in the U.S. and other key markets. Well, we're joined now by Pernod Ricard CEO, Alexandra Ricard. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I mean, look, it, it, huge numbers here. Another, another full year of a record, especially significant considering that in places like Europe, in Asia, and even in the U.S. to some extent, we're heading into a cycle of a downturn. Given the results you've seen, how sustainable is the level of consumer spending if we are going into a more sustained downturn? Listen, uh, what we're seeing so far, uh, and this is uh, a post-COVID uh, human behavior, which is amazing, is it, it, there is definitely a newfound appreciation for conviviality, for celebration, for togetherness. And uh, I'm sure you've witnessed it over summer uh, on terraces that were full, uh, hotels uh, that were operating as well, uh, quite full, uh, tourism, uh, vacation. Uh, so, so far, uh, so good. And, and we've had really record uh, results with our net sales growing by 21%. We hadn't seen this in over 30 years and our profits growing uh, by 25%. And this is really broad-based. I mean, coming from all regions, America's up double-digit 12%, Asia, rest of the world mm -hmm. up 19%, and Europe as well up uh, 19%. So that's the demand side. It's clearly there. But what about the supply side of things? What is the most difficult for you to source now, whether it be materials, whether it be labor, or just the cost of keeping the lights on? No, uh, there's no doubt that uh, supply chain uh, has been disrupted. It has somewhat improved a little bit, but it's still being uh, disrupted. Uh, that's number one. Number two, Obviously, and that's no news for, for anyone right now, but there's, uh, there's inflation. Uh, we have increased our prices uh, basically everywhere, uh, on average, mid-single digit. And you should expect us to continue to increase prices as we enter in our new fiscal year to offset, uh, of course, uh, inflation. Do you think that'll still be in the mid-single digit figures, the price increases going forward? Yeah, that, that's, that's basically a, a broad average. Uh, it will vary from one market to another. It will vary from one brand to another. Uh, but clearly, uh, our, uh, our price increase strategy is designed uh, to offset inflation, uh, of course. And uh, we're investing behind our brands and brand equity to make sure uh, that uh, demand uh, stays there for, for the brands. Are, are there any other levers which you're able to push besides pushing along prices? For example, are you looking at cost cuts, uh, anything of that regard, slowing hiring as well to help keep some of those measures and keep margins in line? Well, that's a great question. There are absolutely many, many uh, levels that we can activate and that we do activate. Uh, obviously, the uh, the first uh, and foremost one is pricing, but then you also have promotional intensity, promotional depth, promotional uh, frequency. Uh, then you also have uh, uh, your mix. Uh, you have your innovation strategy, where you, you, you push new innovations at higher price points that are more uh, margin accretive. And then you have Cox. And on the, the cost mm. side, uh, we have a, a, a number of operational efficiency initiatives uh, to protect as well uh, our, our margin. Alexandra, one thing that, that really struck me as fascinating in this reporting, reporting season, we heard from Fever Tree saying that they're having a difficult time sourcing glass, among other things. Obviously, glass, a very important thing for your business. How acute are those pressures? Are, are we going to see a situation where, you know, you have to look beyond the usual materials you're using? Well, listen, uh, as I mentioned, supply chain is somewhat disrupted. Now we're, we're a big uh, glass uh, purchaser. What we are seeing on the glass front is obviously a lot of inflation, which we're covering through uh, the initiatives I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, we foresee these uh, disruptions to continue, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, i.e. The, the coming months, of course. 
What about when it comes to your sales outlook in Asia? We just learned this morning, at least morning European time, that a, a new city in China was locked down, locking down of 21 million people. The reopening story, it seems still far away for Asia. What does that mean for your outlook? Listen, what it does mean is, is a continued uh, disruption uh, of, of the trade with uh, goes and no-goes, with stop and goes, like we've witnessed over the last 12 months. Uh, so far, as we're moving into mid-autumn festival period, and uh, mid-autumn festival is, is next, next week, uh, the trade uh, is quite confident, and so our, our selling numbers are, are, are quite strong. And we'll see how the sellout uh, takes place in, in the coming weeks. Uh, but so far, so good. What we've seen is easing of restrictions uh, starting uh, the month of June, and uh, we, we, our, our growth has resumed in June after two difficult months because of uh, increased restrictions. So we'll see how things go, but um, uh, there's stop and go. And uh, what's interesting to see is that as soon as the trade reopens, uh, people enjoy going back out again. <laughs> Certainly true. We've seen that, as you said, the conviviality still uh, alive and well in uh, post-lockdown in other regions. I do just want to end it on the energy concerns in Europe. If we're going into a period where costs are going to continue to rise, uh, perhaps demand rationing when it comes to industry, are you doing anything or have you been hedging energy costs? Yeah, maybe two things on that front. First of all, from a, a more long-term strategic perspective, we have a, a clear sustainability and responsibility strategic roadmap where uh, energy saving, energy efficiency is, is core to that roadmap. So these are initiatives we already started work on, on a, a number of years ago with renewable e energy uh, being uh, first and foremost. And second, the more short-term uh, issues, and uh, as a, a European company uh, and a citizen uh, of, of Europe, uh, we're obviously going to do our bit in terms of uh, savings uh, over the winter, uh, which is uh, perfectly fine with us. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Alexandra Ricard, CEO of Pernod Ricard, thanks so much. This is Bloomberg. There's a lot of different potential outcomes as we head into the fall. I think there are huge disparities still out there. Overall, we're still neutral on equities. I wouldn't be surprised if equity markets go down a bit further from here. Everybody's really trading on, on all these different data points, so we expect uh, a lot of volatility ahead in equity markets. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. China ramps up COVID-0. 21 million people in the city of Chengdu will be locked down in a fight to contain a coronavirus outbreak. Warnings of a super bubble in the stock market that has yet to burst. Famed investor Jeremy Grantham says overvalued equities, bonds and housing will collide with high rates and inflation. And British households brace themselves. A new report says they're in for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards and Kelly Lines are off today. Kriti then working through these comments around a market bubble and the direction for the S&P. You know, what's interesting, Tom, is at the end of the day, it really does come down to the COVID story, at least in the Asian session. The idea that a lot of this risk-off sentiment that you're seeing comes from that COVID lockdown. Of course, in China, think about it, another megacity being shut down, which also, by the way, uh, will have implications for those supply chain issues. Once again, uh, a little bit of a deja vu situation. And you can see how that's impacting Asian assets. No surprise here, down 1.9% across the region. If you actually zoom in uh, to the Nikkei specifically, down 1.5%. So once again, that tech-centric focus gets getting hit. Does that uh, really continue on into the U.S. session is going to be the question. And as, of course, you see that China uh, lockdown situation, of course, you're going to see a little bit of a correlation with copper prices also taking it on the chin down to the tune about 2%. I have to say, though, once again, I've been saying this all week, the currency story is the one that's catching my eye here all week. 
all been week. saying it all year. All year, but a little extra this week. Uh, and this currency story is crucial, at least this time when, with the Japanese yen hitting new weakness, now the weakest, going all the way back to 1998, a 24-year low. And I guess the question, Matt, is how low can it go? Yeah, and for the record, I do not disagree with you. Obviously, the currency story is massive. The dollar is approaching a record high. V Valerie Sarasuelo in London uh, points out that the interday level to beat is 1304. Right now, the Bloomberg dollar index at 1297 and climbing. So we're getting close to that level once again. You can see S&P futures are down. It's not just the Asia lockdowns, though that didn't help. It's the NVIDIA news about new export rules to China that really hit that stock in the entire tech sector hard after hours yesterday that are going to hurt the market as we open today. Take a look at crude right now, down below $90 for Texas Intermediate, 87.68 um, as Really, the market grapples with the idea of slower growth. Yes, supply may be tight. There's not a lot of spare capacity um, in OPEC uh, or, or in the U.S. Uh, for that matter, but demand is going to be even worse. Bitcoin right now down under 20,000 as well at 19,932, moving obviously with risk assets and on concern of continued higher rates after what we heard from Loretta Mester yesterday. Tom, what's Europe look like this morning? Uh, yeah, Matt, and just on our oil story, for the context, Chengdu, population 21 million, so almost the same population of Australia, the same population as the Netherlands being locked Very down. Again, to that impact in terms of the demand. Here across Europe, you're heading for five straight days uh, of losses, some pretty heavy selling uh, across the benchmark. You can see in here in the UK down 1.4%, over in France down 1.5%, and losses in Germany of 1.4%. Let's switch it on, see how things then are playing out across these indexes. And you talk about the currencies, I want to match your yen with sterling. Critty, I up you because sterling down five and a half percent in the month of August. That is the worst month since Brexit. And despite that's despite the fact that yields at the front end in terms of gilts, two year yields up around 130 basis points for the month. The biggest jump you've seen in yields since about 1992. Despite that, the pound still being pummeled. And we're looking at that again uh, today. 116 on the pound, a loss of a tenth of a percent. And yields 308 now. That is a jump in terms of yields up six basis points. The sell-off continues. Again, across the benchmark, losses of one and a half percent. And one corporate story to bring to your attention. This is Reckitt Bank. It's a surprise in terms of the CEO stepping down after pretty successfully restructuring this business. They now have an interim CEO. The market's not liking that down a little over 4%. Pretty. Uh, certainly a lot to digest. Really interesting on the macro and the micro front, especially as all eyes on payrolls this week. Let's look, look at what's ahead today. U.S. economic releases include manufacturing and auto sales data for August. You also have Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed due to speak. And President Biden set to deliver a primetime address in Philadelphia on what the White House calls, quote, the continued battle for the soul of the nation, Matt. All right, so we'll follow all of that very closely. But the big news, as you pointed out at the top, um, in markets is China. The city of Chengdu is locking down its 21 million residents. It's a huge move, obviously, in the vast western region of the country that had so far been largely untouched by the coronavirus pandemic. John Liu, Bloomberg's executive editor for Greater China, joins us now from Beijing. So they are sticking with COVID zero and telling people you can't leave the house unless you want to go get groceries once a day. That's right, Matt. Uh, 21 million people, as you said, locked down indefinitely. We do not have an end date for that lockdown. I think that is what people are watching. Uh, it could go one of two ways. It could go something like Shanghai, which was locked down for two months. We've had other cities who've locked down for a few days and then come out of that lockdown. And so uh, really looking forward to whether or not this action by the authorities there in Chengdu stops the outbreak there. If it does, then maybe this is short-lived and a blip. If it doesn't, it could cause real uh, pronounced pain for the economy. Uh, and John, on the geopolitics, we're hearing that Taiwan and Taiwanese uh, military have shot down a drone that apparently came over from the mainland, from China, across to one of the islands uh, that is, of course, controlled by Taiwan. How dangerous is this moment? What do you read into this? And have we heard anything from officials in Beijing in response? So the, the, uh, for the last couple of days, there have been civilian drones being flown from uh, the mainland over to uh, some of the outlying islands under Taiwan's control. It's, these islands are very close to the mainland, so well within the range of a civilian drone. Uh, obviously, uh, this is less severe than if it was a military aircraft of some sort that, that was shot down, uh, but still it speaks to how tense the situation is. 
uh, how on edge everybody is about any interaction between the two sides at this moment. John, thanks very much. John Liu is uh, uh, Bloomberg's managing editor for Greater China out of Beijing. I also want to point out we're getting headlines across from Hong Kong as well, that officials there are targeting the end to the hotel quarantine rules in November. So still two months from now, and it's only a target, but uh, that news at least goes in the other direction. Now let's get to a big warning from a big bear. Investor Jeremy Grantham says the stock's super bubble that he warned about previously has yet to pop. The GMO co-founder sees more trouble ahead due to what he calls a dangerous mix of overvalued equities, bonds, and housing. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now. So Danny, it's not surprising that uh, Jeremy no. Grantham is bearish, but people always find it very interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, definitely a perma bear. It does feel like in this current environment, Matt, though, the bears are the loudest in the room, if, if not the most plentiful. I, I have to read a portion of what he said because it's almost Shakespearean. He said, prepare for an epic finale. If history repeats, the play will once again be a tragedy. We must hope this time for a minor one. So a lot of drama injected in here. But I think the most interesting thing, or among the most interesting thing about Grantham's call that a super bubble hasn't deflated yet is that it's not necessarily about the Fed. Look, we've seen equity markets have this major reprice as that Powell pivot gets priced out. But it's not interest rates that Graham is worried about. It is earnings. It is multiple compression. It is margins taking a hit. That is something that perhaps the market has yet to grapple with. So his original call was down 50% from the peak. At the worst of the June lows, we got to about 25%. It's not just him. It's Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley. And, and Matt, he's a perma bear too. That's also worth pointing out. But he also thinks we're going to retest those June lows. And he also says it's because of earnings. So right now we're trying to digest the Fed. Has the second shoe dropped? EPS for EPS has dropped by about 2.5% from the peak, Tom, which does suggest that if margins are going to deteriorate, there's some pricing in left to do there. OK, the drama in the markets being articulated by Jeremy Grantham. Uh, as you say, Danny Berger, thank you very much indeed. Plenty of drama here in the UK as well as we weigh up the cost of living crisis. It just gets worse, uh, it seems, on a daily basis. A new report saying the UK households are set for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. The Resolution Foundation warned of a 10% fall in real disposable incomes over two years unless there is a support package of tens of billions of pounds. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, at this Resolution Foundation report, it is dire, to say the least. Dire, to say the least, and it underscores the challenge that awaits whoever is the next Prime Minister. The Resolution Foundation says that three million people more are going to be in absolute poverty because of this. Households are going to be £3,000 less well off, and that's despite the £30 billion worth of support that we've already had from the government since March. So we had the Chief Economist of the Resolution Foundation, Mike Brewer, on Bloomberg Radio earlier. He called for this extra support from the government, but of course we know that the front runner to be the next Prime Minister, Liz Truss, is against what she calls handouts. So uh, we also had, remember, uh, uh, the deputy, former Deputy BOE Governor Charlie Bean on Bloomberg TV oh. saying that the tax cuts Liz Truss wants uh, aren't targeted enough at the needy. So yes, it's a very dire situation if you're one of the poorest households in Britain who's most exposed to this cost of living crisis. I thought also the Charlie Bean interview was absolutely brilliant. Highly recommend people go back and look at it. Listen, everyone's talking about Liz Truss as if she is the new PM. Um, give us an update for those of us who don't live in Great Britain. What's, what's the deal? What's the schedule? When do we know for, for certain? All the polls are saying that it's likely to be Liz Truss. Uh, we're going to find out on Monday. I'll be at Downing Street with all the news. Uh, but we had more hustings in London yesterday, and Liz Truss not only said that she would do tax cuts, but she ruled out tax rises. And that's despite this Bloomberg scoop, which revealed Treasury analysis, showing that if the windfall tax were continued, it would generate tens of billions of pounds that could help people with their energy bills because of all these excess profits from the energy companies. But Truss has ruled that out and we have another Bloomberg scoop in fact which says that she would cut business rates and that would kill two birds with one stone because of course businesses here have been so against these commercial property taxes but it would also help them with their energy bills. Bloomberg's Lizzie Murden on all things uh, Europe and specifically the UK. It's a lot to digest. Well, speaking of uh, all things going on across the Atlantic, we do have some breaking news here. A headline coming uh, from Lufthansa here saying that they are going to cancel almost all Frankfurt and Munich flights that coming uh, on Friday. So once again, 
you are starting to see a lot of that energy crunch, that travel crunch specifically hitting those flights. We'll bring you keep, more keep, updates. Keep in mind, well. keep, can, I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep in okay. mind, Kriti, how important this is as a hub because Lufthansa is one of the biggest European airlines and almost all of its flights go through Frankfurt, one of the biggest airports in Europe. So it's huge news um, for the business community and for vacation travelers. I was going to say for vacation travelers, it feels yeah. like everyone is in Europe right now. And of course, as you mentioned, while well, really flying through that hub, we will, of course will bring you all the updates there. In the meantime, let's bring it back to Washington here. Bloomberg sources say federal prosecutors are likely to wait until after the November midterm elections to announce any charges against Donald Trump. This comes <laughs> after the U.S. Justice Department said White House records held in a storage room at the former president's Florida home may have been concealed or removed before a June FBI search. Jack Fitzpatrick, our resident Bloomberg government reporter has the latest from Washington. Jack, walk us through it. Yeah, so the news today, uh, according to people familiar with the process, is that the Justice Department knows they're not going to announce charges uh, if they get to that point before the midterm elections in November. They have guidance, uh, a policy that they have inconsistently followed in recent years, that they're not supposed to take that kind of step uh, and, and reveal information about investigations that are being opened, charges that are being brought that are politically sensitive within 60 days before an election. Like Clinton. Uh, Yes, Comey Clinton, uh, and also the announcement by Bill Barr uh, leading up to 2020 that they may open high-profile voter fraud investigations leading up to the uh, to the the election. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's not really supposed to happen within 60 days. 60 days before the election is just September 10th. Uh, they're obviously not going to finish this uh, by then, and they actually may not get to the point of deciding who to charge or what charges they might want to bring by November. Uh, but at least for now, they're making clear that uh, it, the, the end road of this and the big question of whether the former president would be charged with crimes is not something that's going to be answered before the election. Uh, and part of that is a policy that's meant to avoid having a, a huge effect on the election itself. Hey, Jack, a Democrat won a special election in Alaska to replace the single, their single um, representative, and that sets up a fight with Sarah Palin, right? Uh, it, it was round one of the fight with Sarah Palin. There's going to be a rematch uh, because Don Young, the longtime representative, uh, died earlier this year. They had a special election that took a while to schedule, so they're they're running again in November. But for now, Democrats have one more seat, a little more breathing room for upcoming votes on things like to fund the government and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a it's a notable victory for a Democrat, not just because a Democrat won in Alaska, but won. This was somebody who campaigned pretty specifically uh, and aggressively pushing back on the Supreme Court decision to strike down Roe v. Wade. Uh, and also, this is ranked choice voting. They just installed that new system in Alaska. Sarah Palin, obviously a very high-profile Republican with a following. Uh, she was one of two Republicans. Nick Begich, uh, the other Republican, only about half of his supporters gave their second choice to Palin. Uh, the rest either supported the Democrat uh, or did not choose to use use it. So it's an interesting case study in how this newer system that's uh, being put in place in some states plays out and in this case uh, helped Democrats in a, an unlikely state like Alaska. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government, we thank you as always. Waking up early this morning to give us all things Washington. Let's take a quick look at some of the stocks moving in pre-market trading in the United States. I want to start with NVIDIA, the big heavyweight here, the chip heavyweight, I might add, declining on a warning that a Chinese restriction, or I say a restriction to China, essentially the law governing the exports of artificial intelligence to China, well, that's going to be limited. Well, now the NVIDIA is saying, well, it's going to hurt sales. It's going to hurt their bottom line in a massive way. So you can see that news actually dropping on the shares about 5%. The question is what will the translation be to the broader S&P 500? Once again, I mentioned it is a massive heavyweight in the S&P 500, so we are, of course, going to keep an eye on that, as well as the ripple effect throughout all the chip stocks here. Broadcom, remember, is reporting after the bell, so there is a massive chip story to be had. We, of course, will keep you apprised of it throughout the day on Bloomberg Television. My second mover this morning is going to be 3M. We've been talking about the job cuts all week, this story for Snapchat. We've also talked about it in big tech. We've got payrolls tomorrow. Well, now it's hitting the industrials as well. 
3M planning to eliminate jobs in a broader cost cutting push. Right now, it seems like the stock is unmoved. It was moving earlier in the session, so certainly mm -hmm. a name to keep your eye on. And lastly, we'll go back to the retail favorite, Bed Bath & Beyond, unveiling a turnaround plan that envisions new financing, sweeping store closings, and the sale of as many as 12 million shares of stock. On the news yesterday, of course, the stock dropping some 27% in the session. This morning, the hangover continues down about 5%, Tom. Okay, the Bed Bath & Beyond story is the story that keeps on giving, isn't it? Across these markets, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk uh, further about how to position across these markets as we weigh up these calls around bubble risks and further downside. SD Dweck, Flowbank CIO, is with us. And Russia's 24-hour English language news channel. It may be banned in the US. It's already been banned uh, in the EU, at least parts of the EU, the UK as well. But it's turning its focus uh, to a new audience. Read more of today's Big Take story on Bloomberg.com or by typing in NI Big Take into your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Tom McKenzie in London. We are simulcast on radio and television. Nonetheless, I'm going to show you a chart here that I think is important. I'm going to show those of you watching, those of you listening, can imagine uh, what it looks like. We see financing costs jumping, and that's illustrated on this chart just by two-year uh, yields rising. On the other hand, we see the pound dropping. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was uh, one of the worst months in recent memory since Brexit, actually, for the UK pound versus the dollar for the cable rate. So that puts UK companies in a very difficult position. Joining us to talk about that is Irena Garcia Perez, uh, Bloomberg distressed debt reporter. So Irena, how are we see this playing out? How are we seeing this play out? So we see investors having a lot of question marks and doubts about um, what's to come for the UK economy. It's, of course, a gloomy outlook, but how bad inflation is going to get, um, what the Bank of England is going to do about it. And also, although they are pricing in um, an interest rate hike, of course, but it's also about what the next government is going to do to support um, the economy. Hey, Rennie, what is the read across, if there is a read across, or at least what is the situation in, in the U.S. when it comes to those corporate debt, the stress, the pressure, as we readjust to this more hawkish Fed? Are we expecting to see a blowout in yields? So it is higher. Um, for, for corporate uh, borrowing, it is getting more expensive, but yeah. it's still it's coming back to June levels, and it still has some room to go to 2020 COVID levels. So it's getting worse, and it's getting more expensive, but not as bad as um, in Europe, in relative terms. Yeah, and of course, the UK has its own idiosyncrasies as well. Irene Garcia Perez, thank you very much uh, indeed on what is happening across the corporate bond space. For more market analysis, check out MLive Go on your terminal. Plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here is the first word. In California, blackouts have been averted so far in the midst of a heat wave that could threaten the supply of electricity through next Monday. The state called off its power grid emergency as night fell and it got cooler. The temps reached triple digits in much of the state yesterday. Russia is holding major military exercises with China and India. It's seen as Vladimir Putin's way of pushing back against attempts by the U.S. and its allies to isolate him uh, and his move in the invasion of Ukraine. More than 50,000 troops, 140 aircraft and 60 ships are taking part in the war games in Russia's Far East. And Lufthansa says it will cancel almost all flights to and from its Frankfurt and Munich hubs on Friday. That comes after the German Airlines Pilot Union called for a one-day strike. About 800 flights will be affected in total. Coming up, Esti Dweck, the CIO at Flowbank, joins us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. China ramps up COVID-0. 21 million people in the city of Chengdu will be locked down 
in a fight to contain a coronavirus outbreak. Warnings of a super bubble in the stock market that is yet to burst. Famed investor Jeremy Grantham says overvalued equities, bonds and housing will collide with high rates and inflation. And British households brace themselves. A new report says they're in for the biggest squeeze on living standards in a century. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards and Kayleigh Lyons are off today. Matt, you're checking in on US markets. Here in Europe, the bloodletting continues. Yeah, and I have to say the inflation warnings uh, out of the UK are dire. I mean, um, the yeah. worst inflation, the worst crunch on living standards since the end of World War II will be interesting, uh, World War I will be interesting to see how uh, Liz Truss deals with it if she indeed gets that seat. Take a look at futures here. We're down really on the Chengdu lockdown. Um, it's a huge amount of people. It's a huge drop in demand, especially if it's extended to the any kind of um, length like we saw in Shanghai. Um, and we're also looking at a high in the dollar or getting closer to a high in the dollar. Actually, the intraday level is 1304 spot 55, but we're pretty close at 1290. 98, um, 28, and you can really see that effect in the strength of the dollar, especially if we're talking about Europe over the euro or over the pound. NYMEX crude coming down on concern about a drop in demand under $90 a barrel, way under now at uh, 87.98, and Bitcoin also coming down um, in uh, 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 as it is highly correlated with risk assets, in sympathy with risk, risk assets at 19,800. And 94. Critty, what do you see in terms of the pre-market movers? Because we got that big, uh, dire news from NVIDIA yesterday. We did, and it's really having a major effect on the share price and probably the entire sector, not to mention the entire benchmark. Of course, we know NVIDIA is that massive heavyweight. Declining on that warning, essentially that some that restriction that US, uh, the U.S. government has put on the chip sector broadly, any artificial intelligence, the exports to China, well, there are going to be some limitations on this. NVIDIA is saying it's going to hurt their bottom line, so those shares down to the tune about 5.6 percent this morning and the job losses Matt they continue to the industrial sector we've talked about it in snap we've talked about it in Silicon Valley and big tech well now 3M planning to eliminate jobs in a broader cost cutting push this is something that's going to start uh, picking up steam as we go throughout the week right now it's not weighing on shares but it was moving them earlier in the session so we are going to keep an eye on those names and lastly a retail favorite Bed Bath and Beyond Tom unveiling a turnaround plan that envisions new financing sweeping store closings and get this the sale of as many as 12 million shares of the stock. We know liquidity has been a major issue, and apparently those stock sales are the way to address them. Those shares down 5.4%. I just love how even globally we zero in on this stock, Bed Bath & Beyond, a stock that, frankly, outside of the U.S., probably most of us had never heard of up until <laughs> about 12 months ago or Dude, so. Dude, have you seen Thank Old you. School? No, I've missed out on Old School. Tom well, clearly doesn't go towel shopping. I highly shopping. recommend watching it. They may have to go That's to Bed Bath & Beyond. Gone, it could be a pretty busy Saturday. Uh, here, here, here in Europe, markets continue setting themselves up for five straight days of losses now. 1.6% across the benchmark is the loss that you're looking at. Yes, I have a bit of a UK bias today because the pound, again, is being hit. Of course, Matt was talking about the strength of the US dollar. That, of course, is a factor. And then you have the idiosyncratic pressures within the UK as well. 115 below 116, a loss of two tenths of a percent in the session today. That is despite the fact that gilts continue to rise higher, up five basis points in the session. The sell-off in terms of the front end, particularly here in the UK, pronounced... 130 basis points. That was a move higher in yields just a month of August alone. The biggest jump you've seen since 1992. And a loss, by the way, in the pound of 5.5% in August. The biggest drop since Brexit. One corporate story to bring to your attention is Reckitt Benkis. So it's a maker of consumer goods here in the UK. Down 4.5%. The CEO leaving unexpectedly. An interim executive taking over for the moment. Investors not liking the news. Down almost 4.5%. And, and some big names there as well for US consumers. They make Calgon. They mm. make... Lysol, right? They make Durex, they make Clearasil. Yep. I mean, it's a huge uh, company that a lot of Americans have not heard of. So good to keep an eye on that. Joining us now is SD Dweck, Flowbank CIO, to talk about what we can expect really on both sides of the Atlantic. SD, obviously, inflation is huge here. And, you know, I had a bet with Critty that headline CPI had peaked in the US. And I think I've won that bet. But what does it look like in Europe? Well, I would agree with you on the U.S. front, but uh, I would also agree with you that for Europe and the U.K., we are not there yet. Uh, we saw European inflation come in hot yesterday. 
it doesn't seem like it's the peak when you look at what electricity and gas prices have been doing. Um, we had a couple of good days earlier in the week because German storage levels were better than expected, but we're not even you know, close to winter yet, and those prices are still going up. So a big, big challenge for Europe, and not much better, actually probably even worse uh, for the U.K. So, Esty, the reason that Matt won the bet was he said that it was really all commodities driven. Uh, and then as you saw some of the commodity prices come down, that was what was uh, basically the main driver of inflation. My argument was it was rent. It was the other cost of living pressures. And then he said he wanted to go to Dairy Queen to collect on the bet. Now he's on a diet and now he can't collect. So I really think I came out the winner here. But, Esty, let's go to that point of what's actually driving the story, because, of course, we know commodities has been in the driver's seat. But I'm curious about the other costs here, the rent, uh, the food cost, for example, your take? So you certainly have the goods inflation coming down, and the commodity aspect was huge at the beginning of the year, and that helps. Rent, I think, will probably come down, but slower uh, and maybe not as soon as some of these other prices. And the services area does tend to be a little stickier, so we have to keep an eye on that. But uh, at, the, at the start of the show, you were talking about some of these uh, job cuts that we're going to see, a bit less investments. We'll see what the non-farm payrolls come out as tomorrow. But uh, it does feel that you have a number of different disinflationary signals in the U.S. that are coming through and that inflation will gradually come down, not just because of commodity prices. And we can't really say that for Europe. Uh, Esty, how much of that then is informing this, this call from you? The outlook for risk assets has improved. Uh, wh what are you seeing that Mike Wilson, Jeremy Grantham and others are not at this point? Well, the truth is there's a lot of it is about this disinflation that should come through. The other aspect is that, yes, a lot of people put this sort of expectation of a Fed pivot uh, as the reason for the rally over the summer. But the rally started before uh, the CPI number was a bit better, before the July FOMC minutes. So it started really end of June. We had quite a bit of breadth to the rally. Sentiment is still extremely negative, and you've just quoted a number of reasons why. But short positions have increased. Cash levels are still elevated. People are, were not happy with the summer's rally. Now, is this week a return to those lows? I think the June lows will hold. Are we going to have a straight line up? Clearly not. And I don't think we should expect that into the end of the year either. But we're already pricing in quite a bit of tightening. The bond market hasn't moved that much, at least in terms of rate hike expectations. Yes, a bit more of the 75 for September, but it was really a wash between 50 and 75 anyway, and then a few more hikes. What's changed is the Fed is going to stay higher for longer, so those 2023 expectations need to change. But how bad does the news mm. need to be and need to come out? for us to reprice those June lows and break the, through those. And I think that bar is relatively high. OK, so the view is that the June lows hold. Where does that take you then, Esty, in terms of sector allocation? Well, we saw uh, tech suffer in the last week, of course, because of those central bank hiking expectations. But we had seen a bit of a turn there. And I think at some point, the earnings picture for most of big tech, and you, you have to be more discerning within that sector, but earnings should hold up. And I think that we are going to see technology do better into the end of the year. We have another little spike in yields now. I'm not sure if that continues. I think it will retreat later in the year as we see how much of these uh, rate hikes we've priced in and that growth is going to slow as a result of all the hiking. And that should help technology lead the market higher. So I, I'm really fascinated with the earnings outlook, SD, especially because it seems like consensus, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, for U.S. and U.K., for European earnings, really is too high into next year. Don't you think that higher rates and inflation um, crimp margins in a big way? Well, we've ha we already had that expectation for the second quarter, right? Earnings did come out better than expected. Companies are doing better. We do need to see earnings expectations come down a little bit. One, just from an inflationary perspective, right? That would be better for the inflation outlook for next year if those prices are coming back down, um, as you say. So something to look at, but it feels like everyone's waiting for those earnings downgrades to come through. And I'm not sure how big of a surprise it would be depending on the scale of it. And again, those consumer numbers for now still holding up mostly okay. Some shift 
uh, in spending patterns. But is that new news that earnings need to come down compared to earlier in the year? I'm not convinced. SD, for the likes of both the Federal Reserve, but I argue this perhaps has more to do with the ECB. I'm curious about the currency story. How much of the European weakness has less to do with the energy crisis and more to do uh, with the lack of clarity around the tools that the ECB is using? We've seen uh, that the euro has really just borne the brunt of all of the concerns for Europe. So the growth concern, the energy concern, Certainly the central bank concern, you can add Italian spreads, and of course there's uncertainty around whether that would qualify under the new ECB tool. Now we know that they have a very difficult decision to make with inflation above 9% and rising potentially, and a mandate of 2%, and no, well, they have financial stability, so that still counts, and they'll find a way to work around that. Very difficult decisions. For the ECB and the fact that we don't have that many details and we don't know what's included, uh, I think is being reflected, but it's probably still mostly about inflation, mostly about uh, the gas and electricity situ situation and therefore uh, the Russia-Ukraine war uh, that's weighing on the euro. SD Dweck, thank you very much indeed. CIO at Flowbank. On that note, by the way, Italian benchmark 10 years currently at 394, so closing in on 4%. Uh, yields up about five basis points. SD Dweck, though, saying uh, that risk opportunities uh, looking a little bit more favorable. Those June lows uh, will hold, is the call. OK, coming up, new rules in China may affect hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for chip making NVIDIA. We're going to have the latest next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with John Taylor, Stanford economics professor, coming up at 4.30 p.m. New York, 9.30 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, NVIDIA is falling after it warned new U.S. rules could prevent it from exporting some artificial intelligence chips to China. The company will need government approval to sell the chips to Chinese customers, putting about $400 million in sales at risk. Debbie Wu, who covers the tech supply chain for Bloomberg, joins us now from Taipei. Uh, Debbie, thanks for joining us on this story. What is the latest? What do we know then about these new restrictions that the U.S. is putting on companies like NVIDIA? So uh, both NVIDIA and uh, AMD have uh, received notices from uh, the U.S. government that they will, they will need uh, approval to uh, sell some of their products to uh, Chinese customers. And then the reason for this is that uh, uh, these products uh, have a uh, potential military uh, use or they could go to a uh, military uh, uh, end users. And the uh, products that uh, are being affected are high-end uh, GPUs that could be used as uh, uh, on, uh, uh, AI functions. And this is the latest uh, U.S move to curb China's chip technology progress because uh, ah. the uh, U.S. fears that uh, uh, China could use these uh, cutting-edge tech to uh, uh, build its uh, military cloud and then uh, further uh, conduct uh, further uh, surveillance on its uh, population. Right. I mean, this is, you know, ongoing, it feels like, since the Trump trade war into this administration. Remind us of some of the other recent moves that the U.S. has made to curb China's access to chips. So uh, actually, the uh, uh, probably the uh, most impactful move that uh, the Trump administration has made is uh, restrict China's uh, uh, access to uh, the advanced chip making uh, equipment from uh, the Dutch company ASML. So uh, the uh, Ch China now cannot get uh, ASML's most advanced extreme uh, extreme uh, ultraviolet uh, lithography machines. But uh, the uh, uh, Biden administration has made some further moves, including uh, over the past month or two, it has told uh, equipment suppliers in the U.S. not to sell China uh, gears that can make chips that's uh, 40 nanometer or more advanced. And this means that uh, while China still will still be able to make uh, uh, mature chips, it probably uh, its capability to uh, build uh, advanced chips at home will be uh, seriously hampered without support from uh, U.S. companies. 
Debbie, I'm curious about what this means in terms of timing. Is this all these geopolitical tensions, is it coming at a good time in regards to the idea that there might be this kind of uh, decline in the momentum for global demand? Can you add a little bit of color on that? Uh, I think one thing that's really uh, interesting is like uh, the U.S. midterms are coming up and then uh, it seems like uh, the Democrats could uh, face a uh, tough battle, uh, battle uh, ahead of the uh, uh, elections. So uh, it's, but at the same time, it seems like uh, there's a bipartisan consensus that uh, uh, the uh, U.S. government and the Congress have to be on top, uh, be tough on China. So uh, it could be that uh, uh, by uh, making, uh, tightening uh, uh, China's ex access for China to uh, uh, secure advanced technologies, the uh, Biden administration could uh, appear to be uh, tough on uh, Beijing. And this could be a good uh, booster for their uh, uh, mid mid midterm uh, prospect. But at the same time, mm. as the, uh, you know, uh, each government, uh, major governments around the world are racing to build up uh, chip capacity at home. It is uh, probably important for uh, Washington to make sure that uh, China does not catch up with uh, the West in a very uh, short period of time. Debbie, if we zoom out a bit, what, what is the situation in terms of supply of semiconductors? That we've heard from some companies about inventory buildup. Are we getting back mm -hmm. to kind of pre-pandemic levels of supply? Uh, so we it. It is a bit more complex than that. So uh, we have seen uh, companies like NVIDIA, uh, AMD, and Micron offering a uh, really uh, weak business outlook over the past month. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, there are some companies that continue to say that they cannot get enough chips to build their products. So uh, sort of in light of this context, uh, chip maker Broadcom actually is expected to uh, provide, uh, uh, to grow at the uh, most uh, fa uh, to grow at the fastest pace uh, since the first quarter of uh, 2018. So uh, it looks like it really depends on what kind of uh, segment or uh, what kind of uh, mm. chips you are uh, making. So if you are making the kind of chips that uh, still some companies lack, then uh, you probably would be uh, doing better, very better than uh, your uh, peers. OK, so a little bit of nuance when it comes to these inventory build-ups. And, of course, Debbie Wu with the latest on these U.S. restrictions, the impact on NVIDIA. Thank you. Joining us out of Taipei. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, sticking with the tech story, CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz. That is going to be at 5 p.m. in New York. That's 10 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Tom McKenzie in London. Tom Keen joins us now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, the original. And Tom, what's your single best chart for the day? My single best chart is I just wish it was the end of August and nothing was going on. Unfortunately, that is not the case this morning, Matt. We have some really interesting, if not August-like historic markets shown in foreign exchange with sterling through 116, some other interesting levels as well. Let's look at the tension in the memory of 1998 and even back to 1991. Asia DXY, this is a snapshot of currency weakness of the Pacific Rim without Japan. The Asian financial crisis over on the left, the broad long-term recovery of Asia as they learned lessons of the West. And now the big rollover where today we break down and go back to 2004 at levels. This is profound. I should note moments ago, J.P. Morgan publishes and reaffirms again, possibly to the middle 140s. That is unimaginable. And Tom, with that weakness that you're seeing in Asia, and I'd say China specifically overnight, you have some pretty good commodity moves as well. Talk to us about your lineup to discuss some of that. Well, we're going to fold it in here on a Thursday into Jobs Day. Obviously, Jobs is going to be front and center. We're going to talk to U.S. economists about that. But far more, it's a linkage of foreign exchange into Fed policy and oil. Jean Bovin is without question our lead here. He could be a future governor of his Bank of Canada. He is at BlackRock, and Francisco Blanche on short notice comes in. We're thrilled to have a leader of Bank of America, hydrocarbons on new weak oil. 
Tom Keen, we thank you as always. Let's head to our What to Watch segment. I'm specifically watching Broadcom earnings. The chip sector has become uh, extremely interesting just in the last 24 hours. We heard from NVIDIA. We've heard about these Chinese lockdowns. Broadcom is going to come out with their earnings after the bell. Remember, their strategy uh, has long, for a very long time been to acquire and to get bigger. How does that really work in an environment where you're looking at more antitrust scrutiny and now, of course, uh, this background of pain in the chip sector, Matt? Yeah, it's going to be huge. Um, um, to watch that sector today. I'm watching um, the big box retailers because of the um, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond reorganization. They're going to take a loan. They're going to buy a ton of shares. They're going to close like over 100 stores, hopefully not the one um, out in Westchester on Central Avenue. Uh, I just think it's a huge move, not just for Bed Bath & Beyond, but for a number of those that line strip malls around the country. And it reminds me of of old school, which Tom McKenzie hasn't seen. And Tom, I don't think you've seen many Will Ferrell mov movies at all. So I thought I would give you my a top sing three. A single one. You've not so seen I've got one? Your right. got your I would start with, if yeah. I were you, I would start with Step Brothers, because I think it's an absolute masterpiece. I would then move on to the other guys uh, with Mark Wahlberg, as well as Dwayne Johnson and Michael Keaton. Um, it's amazing as well. And then, you know, old school is unmissable. You have to have seen that, I think, to be a grown man. <laughs> okay. That's number three on your list. And that's also to understand Bed Bath. No, you didn't. You lined up my weekend as well. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so from the movie rundown to a slightly more serious topic, the IAEA officials. So these are these, uh, of course, nuclear uh, atomic agency officials. They're on the ground in Ukraine. I think it's really important. There's a key risk around the Daporizhia nuclear power plant. That's in the east of the country. They're making their way there. There is still shelling. We're going to see whether or not they can actually inspect this plant. They've been handing out the Ukrainians iodine pills around this area because they're so concerned about a potential nuclear fallout. Russian forces are embedded there, so we're watching that story as well. Okay, that is it uh, for early edition. More surveillance is ahead. I'm just going to give you a quick update on where the markets stand at this point in the trading day. Losses of 1.4% across the benchmark here in Europe. US futures, S&P e-mini's pointing lower by six-tenths of a percent. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.